Welcome, everybody, to Strife Sanctum. And I was deciding against recording this until I was absolutely ready. But it turns out I had way more free time than I thought over Christmas break. And even though I recorded Breath of Fire 3 yesterday, at time of recording, I decided to might as well finish up this project and start anew. And... The thing I will say, first and foremost, is that this is going to be something that I put a little bit more effort into than I did before in terms of research, in terms of watching with a keen eye. Because this is something that I normally don't do. Um, I've been away from, like, American cartoons and things of the like for the longest time. I've been an anime fan for about 20 years, and for the last 10 or so, I haven't really dove back into, like, American cartoons, and I've kind of stuck with anime as kind of that cartoon itch. And yet, when those two worlds of American cartoons and anime align in such a fascinating, long-term vision like this, it's it's one of those striking things that it it affected me so much that not only did I watch it once, not only did I watch it twice, but I'm watching it back for a third time. I've even showed my family this show as well, and that show is Ruby. And for those who don't know, this is an American cartoon from, a, I believe, a Texas-based company known as Rooster Teeth. Now, they're responsible for stuff like Red vs. Blue, Genlock, uh, Neon Kobini, Ruby Chibi, and such, but this is the thing I know them best for. And again, this is not anime in the technical sense. But to me, this is about as close to an anime as you can get for an American cartoon because it's dripping in that sort of ephemera and in that style. Much like The Matrix took inspiration from anime and, you know, Japanese cartoons and stuff when they're doing their fight scenes, it's hard not to look at Ruby and think, well, this is as close as anime as you're going to get because the influences are all over the place. And to top that all off, when you think of the cast list, and I'm going to go into extensive detail, like I normally do, about the cast, sure, you have your own American actors, but the majority of the characters in this show are anime voice actors, anime dub actors. Rooster Teeth was lucky enough to be affiliated with Funimation, uh, I guess they're in the same region, like Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, Houston, that sort of area. And, you know, obviously you're going to get people from L.A. as well when this thing took off. And take off it did. Um, it is a franchise that has spawned video games, one of which is going to have a console release uh, very soon, known as Grim Eclipse. It started as a Steam game for a while. Maybe it was a mobile game as well. But I'm here to talk about the anime proper and maybe dive into Ruby Chibi as well as a spinoff. But... I couldn't tackle this all at once. There is no way in hell I could have done that at all. So the way I decided to do it, given that this is a long-term project, and given the fact that they have had eight seasons going on to nine now, the only way I was going to do this in a reasonable time frame rather than have like a two or three hour podcast to going through it all and who knows, this might be a two- or three-hour podcast in and of itself, given how much I have to dive into. There will be spoilers, but I will keep it solely to the volumes in question, because Ruby is neatly divided into three specific arcs. The first three volumes are the Fall of Beacon, the initial setup of the story and its characters. The second unveils... Uh, in the fourth and fifth seasons, unveils the big villains of the piece and a different storyline and a different setup. And then six through eight, yet another different city. So they all kind of feed into each other in a different way. So it's going to be volumes one through three, volumes four and five, and then volumes six through eight. So those are going to be separate episodes. And the way I'm going to approach this, I think, is talk about some plot and then go into a what I would consider a very extensive character list. Um, I tend to do characters first, but it's kind of hard to do that 
without understanding the world that Ruby inhabits. And the way they wrote this, they had Monty Ulm, uh, Carrie Shawcross, and Miles Luna all create it. And I believe Monty Ohm is the one who created the majority of it and came up with the idea, and he ran with it. And the amount of stuff that going back and watching this and knowing how much he foreshadowed and how much they ended up foreshadowing, stuff that wasn't even there until Volume 6, Volume 7, Volume 8... The fact that they thought this far ahead for a show that they didn't even know would be a success is frightening. So it's one of those stories where you could say, okay, did they listen to story and listen to fans when they created the story? I'm sure they had ideas. But the amount of stuff that they foreshadow leads me to believe that they had this all planned out in advance, and then they decided to change some things on the fly as each season was going on, as they were developing the story and developing the characters and visuals more, to understand what the fans wanted. Now, there is a prevailing theory that Ruby isn't the same as it was. It started off as a comedy show, and that's great. But for me... I actually like what they ended up doing with Volumes 3 and then onward. There's only so much that you can do with the original two seasons without turning into a, like a Family Guy or a Simpsons kind of thing. I like the fact that they started out as a comedy. It made me engrossed in the characters, as we'll see. But knowing where they're going and knowing the stakes that are involved and knowing just how much stuff they do... It's a better choice to go the more serious route. And again, people may not like that. I've seen, I mean, I haven't watched any like extra footage or extra belief. But to me, whenever I talk about Ruby, people are like, ah, oh, the seasons or whatever. And, you know, I liked it better when it was a comedy or it's not the same. You know, the whole Simpsons crap. But my role here is to be an objective observer and go through that, but also try to give my opinions on what I just saw, because I'm recording this as the end of Volume 3 hits me. So I am keenly aware of what I want to say and how I want to say it. But we'll start by talking about Remnant itself. The reason that this show works so well is that the world itself is its own uh, fantastical world known as Remnant. And in between some episodes, they even talk about the world as it is and how it's created and what people are involved. The world of Remnant is a place that, as of those first three volumes, is overrun by Grimm. And Grimm are just nasty, zombie, skeleton-looking monster things that are hard as hell to kill, and they are overrunning the planet. Nobody knows why they exist. They just do, and they are dangerous. And again, these are things that I can't allude to because of spoiler reasons for later volumes, of course. But suffice it to say, there is a reason they exist, and it is a scary reason they exist. There is a reason that the world of Remnant is the way it is, and the reason that a lot of things are messed up. A lot of things don't really seem right. It doesn't help that the moon itself is basically a half of a moon with the rest of it in pieces. So this is not meant to be a fun setup for what was ostensibly a comedy. Uh, the world is also overrun by elemental forces known as dust that turn into crystals. And basically anything from fire to earth to water to you name it can be crystallized into this dust stuff. And some people use it as weaponry, some use it as energy, some use it as just elemental amplification, you name it. The world is teeming with it. And it is a prized commodity. One of the cool things about having this dust and this grim setup is that, well, how do you fight these giant beings? Well, you could use dust, or you could use what is known as hunters and huntress huntresses. The conceit of the early show is that everything is done in like a school environment. Like a Harry, I don't know if it's specifically Harry Potter based, but I wouldn't be surprised if they watched Harry Potter and took references and took things from that. I'm not a Harry Potter guy, so I can't say if this, like, 
multiple schools and multiple powers and all this stuff makes sense. It's got a little bit of superheroes. It's got a little bit of magic. It's got a little bit Harry Potter. All these cool things that fit around. But the the goal of the schools is simply we need to train people with special powers to kick the shit out of Grimm. Because the Grimm will kill us all if we don't. It's a simple setup that they build on afterwards. And the schools are host to people with what are known as semblance and aura. So aura is the power that they possess. Semblance is the actual superpower that manifests. So aura isn't something that you can just have. It's a limited resource of, of power, like an MP or SP bar that you can use these special powers. And everybody has a special superpower known as a semblance. So when we get to the character side, not only do they have specific weapons that they use to fight, but they have their own semblances that they can use. So I will detail them all and kind of go over like each character's importance to the plot, how they use their semblance, how you how you see it used. But you have to use these things. You have to just create these things. And you build upon this base, and that's where we're starting with. We've got this world overrun by monsters with these schools that are safe in these cities that are supposedly safe. But people have been doing some dangerous things, like a string of dust robberies. And as I said before, dust is a prized commodity that has elemental properties in it. And somebody's taking a liberty of just hauling it all and basically being a drug kingpin or something, or a crime kingpin. So that's our setup. It's a basic setup, really good for a first season. Nothing too complex because... Obviously, they don't want to like overload you with the world building, and honestly, they don't even overload you with the world building stuff until like uh, season six and seven. Like the scope of it doesn't even hit you until that far away. So when you're starting with season one, they started off slow enough. It's like a D and D campaign where you're fighting goblins the first time, you're saving a town for the first time, and then eventually, like the, the giant big bads are mucking things up. And later, it's that sort of setup. So seasons one through three act as we're we're ge- going to give you some villains to start off with. And then we're going to uh, pull the rug out from under you. So volume one is really where the main characters show up and start. I'm going to get a drink of water here for just one second. But as far as characters go, we do, I do have a list of this. I said I was going to do a little bit more research because it's kind of hard to talk about Ruby without talking about as many characters as possible. Because a lot of them, in most cases, stay around for a long time. And knowing the main characters is great, but you also have to know what they're fighting or who their friends are or what their semblances are and get the the gist of things. And that allows you to like see their growth as they go. And when you start with Ruby, you obviously start with Ruby Rose. Uh, she was voiced by Lindsay Jones. Her weapon is an awesome, like, crescent scythe-looking thing, but it can also double as, like, a sniper rifle. And utilizing that with her semblance, which is known as super speed, Ruby's able to just glide around, uh, glide around like, anywhere she wants to and fly anywhere she wants to. She leaves, like, rose petals in her path and shit. And she's able to shoot things from afar, but then come up close and just swipe at shit, and she's able to just be a super fast, really keen fighter, which kind of belies her character in a way she's very um she's very reckless she's very uh brave but somewhat oblivious and somewhat stupid on times but she has a good perceptive nature about her i i was worried um in the second and third season when the villain started becoming a thing that ruby was kind of adult well like kind of adult because she's the she's the comedic foil she's a bit of a nerd you know she takes she takes things for granted and has a lot of fun with it. But when it comes down to it, when things get shit and get serious, she's able to see like things aren't right. I have to investigate. She's able to just like see things and like, I'm going to rush in regardless of the situation. If I'm by myself or I'm with my friends and it's just like, she is the emotional core and she is the main character of this show. She leads team Ruby and without her, the show wouldn't work because you have that earnest nice streak which is balanced out by why schnee uh cara eberle 
And Weiss is part of the Schnee Dust Company, and her semblance is actually genetic. And it's the cool utilization of, like, elemental glyphs and stuff. So she's able to, like, glide around the battlefield or block maneuvers, maneuvers as they're coming. And you, you just... It's a, it's a kind of defensive and support mechanism. But she's able to just use her weapon, which is an elemental sword. So she's got it locked in with, like... Uh, think of, like, Squall's Gunblade from Final Fantasy eight or something except that she's able to just utilize hey i want to use fire hey i want to use ice hey i want to do this to do different attacks but then she's messing around with glyphs and she can raise it up into the sky and like hey you need a platform to run on a building here you go i'll, I'll give you steps you know that sort of crazy stuff and later on in season three she's able to even use summoning which is what's one of her major uh like, fuck you moves, um, whether it's a defensive or offensive option. And Weiss is, at first, um, very prissy and, like, I'm better than everyone and I'm just great because I, I come from a family that I'm an heiress to. But quickly you realize that she knows that something's not right and she doesn't, like, like her family. She likes some of her family, but she hates someone specific and it causes problems again things that they don't go into as much in these early seasons but again you're foreshadowing so much stuff and there's like an early season like kerfuffle with ruby being all reckless and weiss being a bit of a bitch and then like why should have been the leader all along and then she just quickly drops it it's weird how you would think that in under normal circumstances they'd be the eternal rivals and whatever and I hate you when they just drop it <laughs> they know that they have other things to go by so they take this like they're rivals and shit and they just drop it halfway through and it's like it's kind of nice because you have other characters you have to get to you have uh, Blake Belladonna Aaron Zek who is able to leave behind a copy of herself an exact mimic and then a person like attacks it and then realizes oh shit it's not real and then she just comes in and just swipes at you uh her weapon is like a kind of a grappling hook thing so she's able to just fly around and um again everybody's like super fucking fast but ruby has like the super speed blake is just i have a grappling lasso excuse me she has a grappling lasso she can just waltz in and just wring someone's neck and then shoot at it and stuff so she's able to just be like very shadow oriented and you know sneaky but sneaky in a good way like she doesn't just stay in the back of the party and Blake's whole thing is that she is what is known as a faunus and Ruby does a good job of making the faunus out to be a lesser race so you have a racial component or a gender equality situation going on here and they touch on that on occasion uh Blake feels like she's minimized and relegated to nothing and that's Weiss's early problem with Blake is that she's a fauna she's just stupid and then Blake is just like no stop it I, I I hate you and just stop thinking I'm lesser than you so there's that little thing going on and she's trying to hide her hide her uh, issues and then rounding out the main party you have Yang Zhao Long um, voiced by Barbara Dunkelman her fighting style is interesting because she's a close range i'm going to kick the shit out of you with my fist she's got these like uh gauntlet things that just blow up i told you before about the gunblade thing think of that but in a fist where she'll attack and then it like blows up for half a second her semblance is interesting because it's basically hulk smash it's seriously that like she takes damage and then she basically hulks up and then beats the shit out of you based on how much she got hurt. So her whole thing is that she is Ruby's half sister. And as reckless as Ruby is, Young is like having the time of her life and she's having fun and beating the shit out of dudes. And she wants a fight. She doesn't really care she just wants to fight dudes and it it's kind of, it kind of gets more complicated in volume three as we'll talk about but you have those four differing personalities that help to to add to the allure of the show and everybody seems to get an equal share that's cool they didn't just focus on ruby they focused on all four of them because they are a team and 
alongside that team, you get a second team known as Juniper. And um, first character is John Ark, uh, voiced by Miles Luna, one of the co-writers. So he definitely knows what's going on, and he's able to... He's the he's a nerd. He just doesn't have a fucking power to save his life. Everybody else had a semblance. He doesn't, as far as we know. It takes him a while to get it, and I will say he gets one later. He doesn't get one in seasons one and three, and he's played for the butt of a joke. His whole thing is he's got a shield, he's got a sword, and he's got sort of a spine, I guess? Not really. Sort of, sometimes. He's a wimp. He is a wimp, and it is played that way. In fact, the early first season or so, like, he is the wimp. That said, he's got a couple of friends with him in his party, one being Nora Valkyrie, voiced by Samantha Ireland. Uh, Her whole thing is she's got this gigantic fuck-off hammer, but it also works as like a grenade launcher. So you're already starting to see that almost everybody except Jean has a weapon that can be close and long-range, which makes him even sadder. But she has a warhammer slash grenade launcher, and she's just... Bat shit insane. She, uh, I was talking about comic relief, and Nora is comic relief. She's super powerful, super stupid, and super in love with a friend. But goddammit, is she not cheerful as hell. Her semblance doesn't show up until season three. Uh, high voltage. She's Electro, basically. And she takes... Or Thor. Thor's hammer, duh. So Thor or Electro, she absorbs voltage and then sends it right back at you and you die and Nora has so much fucking fun um her friend is Lyren voiced by uh, Monty Um himself in the first two seasons but Neith Um in the second or, or the third excuse me his weapons or dual pistols he's sort of like a ninja type so he's actually got an interesting semblance that doesn't manifest all that often but it's known as tranquility and it's not really a stealth mechanic. It's more of like hiding negative emotions. The grim feed off of negative emotion. So he's able to mask that. And again, it doesn't manifest until later. But he is kind of the least referenced character in, in the, you know, the main eight characters. But he does get his moments. And honestly, I think he gets more character uh, in the chibi spinoff the comedy spinoff he gets more character development than all of ruby one through three he gets some in four through eight but we'll save that for later but we have to end with pira nikos and of those of those characters in the in the other four of team juniper she is the most important by far uh she's voiced by jen brown she is captain america and magneto mixed together and that is as scary as it sounds Uh, Her weapons are a Captain America shield and a spear, and she can do do Captain America shit with it. But she also has the ability to, not like full-bore Magneto, I've got all of your guns pointed at your face sort of problem, but she can manipulate magnetism to a certain extent, and she doesn't actually use it all that often until it matters, because she doesn't want to stand out. It's weird because she is like why she is like the best of the best and everybody knows it and yet she doesn't like she doesn't harp on it. What Pira does best is she's like Captain America. She doesn't try to go for the glory. She just exists as a symbol. But she also is unsure of herself and where her place lies because everybody thinks she's unapproachable and un you know unyielding and like what Weiss would sound like. Weiss is the prissy princess, and Nor- uh, Pira is Captain America. Like, you know you Captain America, you know fucking Pira. It's, it's just on on that way. So she actually uh, sympathizes with Jean more than anybody else, despite his shortcomings, and that's really where the first two seasons thrive. Um, but we'll round out the characters with... Uh, and this is where we get the main like party first, and we have that top eight, the main eight characters. They will be there for the entire three volumes. Along with them 
is Professor Ozpin, uh, Shannon McCormick. So he is the headmaster of Vale and Beacon. So Beacon the Academy in the city of Vale. So I might get that confused here and there. Just know Beacon is the, is the school he runs in the city of Vale. That way I can keep my head straight. Because I always hear the fall of Beacon, and it's the fall of Beacon Academy, not the fall of Vale. But we'll get to that when we get to that. So his whole thing is he has a walking stick, he has a pimp stick, and it works. And for what little action he does see, he has super speed, he has like defensive capabilities, he has an amazing power, but he doesn't really have a semblance. But Ozpin stands there as this character that knows everything and sees everything, and it, it, it comes across as something that the characters don't know until way later but he keeps them at arm's length because he himself knows everything about what's going on and he is kind of that character that will throw in all of the foreshadowing and storyline stuff when you need it or when you need to fight the big bad guys he's there and he you know suddenly unveils that he's super awesome in almost every way um, he has a second in command as Glinda Goodwitch, uh, Kathleen uh, Zelcher's Welch. I'm trying to get it. Her weapon is a crop, I suppose. It's like a riding crop that you hit horses with. Um, or you, like a teacher, you'd whip them with a stick, I guess. Um, but she is closest to Harry Potter esque magic as you can get. She uses it like a magic wand and she can do like telekinesis and she can like repair all the damage there's like a scene in volume two where the there's like this crazy ass food fight between the top eight characters and glinda just walks in and just says you fuckers ruined the the cafeteria and she just waves her crop around and then puts it all back together and she has to be the the uh, bad cop to ospin's good cop he's sitting there letting people have fun and a uh, good witch who doesn't really show up in later volumes she's she's still around but for some reason after volume three she's like the one character you don't see anymore and i don't know if that was because of um character like not being somebody that was popular or whatever or just you know character wise they didn't need her for a specific volume and she's just kind of been left to the side not that i don't like her but again it's one of those things like you have like 10 to 12 different characters you have to give time for and she gets her time with Ozpin or any of the bigger name characters that we'll get to as the volume 2 and volume 3 progress but the main villain of the first season is Roman Tortwick uh Gray G Haddock who also produced a lot of the show um Tortwick is a kingpin mixed with oh god think the kingpin mixed with like quicksilver from like a marvel movie or or wandavision uh quicksilver from wandavision this sly smarmy fuck um so he owns all of the dust and he robs it all and he's got this like pimp stick that wields as a gun and a and a and a just a metal cane to hit people with uh he doesn't have a semblance though as far as I know, and that's his one flaw, is that he, despite all the havoc that he causes, is more of the kingpin type. He is the one leading all this, at least supposedly, dust robberies from the shadows, because he knows he himself is decent fighting-wise, but he's not going to beat up any of the top eight. He's not going to take on Ozpin in a fair fight. That's just not what's going to happen. At most, he's going to fend himself and then run the fuck away. Or he's going to have a second in command or a bunch of goons or something. And for the first three volumes, he's there as an ever-present annoyance. He is a pest. And uh, Haddock plays him very well. Again, a lot more of the slickster, huckster type of character than, say, the kingpin, big and brooding and, you know, bruising type. So you have your main characters and you have your plots and you have your setup. Um, the first season is a lot of, like, here is how the school works. Here is how Torchwick is able to get all these dust robberies going. Here is these characters that we're building up and 
you're hearing Ozpin and Goodwitch setting up how the school works. And a lot of the first season is Ruby and Weiss don't see the eye to eye. Weiss is calling Blake a bitch because she's a faunus and a piece of shit. John and his John and sucks. He gets bullied everywhere. Uh, pretty basic stuff in the first season. But there are some good things about it because you have these allusions to race relations. You have these allusions to I'm better than you. So I should have done this. The, the jealousy involved. You have the, the bigger threat of the grim, but they don't overwhelm you with all the heavy shit first. The first season is a very comedic show and it's a lot of like testing the waters. And along with that testing, you have this, um, really weird, like, CG animation and I like the CG animation but the, watching those first couple of seasons until maybe season three it's 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 like a demo tape it is very primitive uh you'll see sequences of people like uh floating across the ground when they couldn't animate them walking uh in the first season in particular any person who is not a main character or even like a secondary character was just a black shape so they didn't have a hell of a budget to work with, and they decided, we'll cut corners. And that's fine, I suppose. Um, but Vale and Beacon Academy is set up as this gigantic bastion of of this city that they build the hunters and huntresses for this region. It's surrounded by a lot of forests and towns, and, like, you'll spend a lot of time in classrooms and, like, uh, high school shenanigans. It's a high school comedy, with the trappings of a superhero novel or a superhero movie tacked on. And that's really fun and really engaging. And despite my issues with the CG and, you know, the, the weird things about it, the semblances that they get, the effects, even in those early days, were really spectacular. When they get to the fight scenes, oh God, do they make those fight scenes work. It's a lot of like crazy, like super fast frenetic action and people running all over the place and hitting each other and doing the the wrestling no-sell thing where you take a shit ton of damage and you pop right back up and just fight some more. Um, the character interactions are great because in the early seasons, like Ruby, Weiss, Yang, Blake all feel different, act differently. It isn't until like the second or third seasons where they start like to to um, condense themselves and start not being as much of a character anymore and start focusing on their specific backstories and when their backstories are good. So I can kind of see why people would like these first couple of seasons more because the characters feel like characters. There might be archetypes, but they feel like characters. They don't feel like four people who are fighting towards a common goal, but they and of themselves don't act all that different. That is the one knock I would have against the more serious approach is the characters themselves don't, you know, once the serious stuff hits the fan, they don't really change who they are much. They're more focused on, I know this person, so this is my storyline now, that sort of thing. Um, but they are changing and they are ever changing and they talk about changing a lot and those character dynamics and sort of world building is so good, but it's all put together with this first intro theme. The, I, I will talk about the music in this series is amazing. Uh, it's got this like Evanescence meets Nightwish meets like, um, you know, that mid tier, uh, mid-year Nightwish with the pop version singer Annette Olsen instead of you know Taria you know they have a guy Jeff Williams doing all of the all of the stuff and like a Pro Tools thing and he's just got this like driving fucking guitar and drums and just, when you hear it you're hearing metal you're hearing like softer operatic piano stuff you're hearing all this crazy stuff and he gets away with a lot of writing where he's alluding to things that happen these seasons and as he's going along, he brings in Casey Lee Williams, who I believe is his daughter, as the singer, and she is always the singer. So you have this through line in every season. These same people, a lot of the voice actors, a lot of the characters have stuck around for a long time. 
and the music, the musicians have stuck around for a long time. So the same people have done it forever and it builds up and you get this like air of nostalgia in it. And that first theme is just a super like driving theme telling you I'm in this school and I'm uh, underappreciated because I'm Ruby Rose. I'm a bit of a dork. And then I will prove them wrong because I will kick the shit out of dudes and make my make my presence felt. Um, so it sets a tone for that first season. The other thing I will mention about the first season is the short runtime. A lot of the episodes are like five minutes. Um, it doesn't take until like the second or third season they would really start to develop like 10 to 20 minute episodes. The first season is like a mini a mini series where like a web comic kind of thing where they do like two episodes in short like four or five minute sprints each and then they'll have a bigger long 10 minute episode or something I, again i think that was due to budget but at the same time you get in and you get out because this was released on a weekly schedule all the time so it got away with a lot of fun things so volume one is a lot of quick wit character building storyline building storyline progression but with characters that you know will be around for a while but also not giving away too much stuff all at once it's giving you a, a, a comedy to sink your teeth into but giving you that sense that something darker is approaching and it does even in season two it still maintains the comedic effect in season two but the stuff kind of changes a little bit um it's around this time in volume two that the animation starts to be better all of the character models are now full like all of the main like the like the supplementary characters are all like actual character models you got better animation though it's still a little stiff and like a little bouncy on occasion um they start adding new antagonists to the mix you've got this thing known as the vital festival where all of the schools not just uh beacon academy but you have haven atlas and vacuo the other big places coming together and doing a tournament so it's a big festival and a big fun thing and they start adding that in there and they start adding in some characters in in the form of uh penny polandina i would say one of the more popular characters um that they introduced other than the main eight and her voice actress was taylor mcnee and her weapons are amazing uh she's able to conjure up these um, like quick flying sword things if anybody ever played symphony of the night the sword that kind of flies around in the in the ether pretty much but the these can actually like go wherever she wants to she can spin around like 10 fucking swords at once and just shoot them off one at a time or all together she can even like use a beam of light and blow shit up and she doesn't have a semblance per se because she doesn't need one it's made abundantly clear in the beginning of the show again they might talk about the semblance later and this could be something that way later because her storyline doesn't really kick off until like six volume six but she's here in volume two and three so they don't really tell you what her semblance is what they do say is that she is actually an artificial android and holy shit she is powerful and holy shit she is awesome every time she meets somebody she goes salutations and she's just this bouncy mousy looking girl but she's an android it's like if i guess from persona 3 was like just just this fucking bouncy mousy girl it's crazy um you know because sometimes you don't have that sometimes you have the androids that are like super serious and stiff penny is not that um she takes a liking to ruby and it's awesome because ruby gets all the scenes with penny and she like like penny's running away from from atlas military and she just dumps ruby in the trash can and is like eh, there you go um I talked about the Atlas military. We have James Ironwood, uh, Jason Rose. His um, weapon of choice that doesn't show up a bunch, but shows up when it has to, is a bunch of revolvers. He is a big, burly guy. His whole thing is he is resilient. They even call it metal. Uh, not metal as in, like, the iron or whatever. Metal as in resiliency, bravery. Um, 
it's more just like he has this thick skin and is able to just tell people, no, I am going to do what I want to do, whether you think it's a good idea or not. And there's this issue with Ironwood and Ozpin all along where they don't like see eye to eye because Ironwood has the military and Ospin's like, no, you're bringing a bunch of people and Grimm to our city. You've got to stop it. So there's a bit of a back and forth between them. But Ironwood is very important, as is P Penny. Uh, we've got Sung Wukong and Neptune Vasilius. So um, Sung Wukong and Michael Jones, he's like Zadon from Final Fantasy IX kind of looking guy. He's also a faunus, but he's got like a, like a monkey tail kind of thing. He reminds me of... Um, the Monkey King from the Journey to the West, if you ever read or watched that stuff. He's got the quarterstaff, and he's got, like, a, a crazy, like, it's called Via Sun. It's like these protector um, spirits that come out and waste shit, so he's able to, like, use a lot of, like, acrobatic stuff with his tail, but use his quarterstaff to beat the shit out of dudes. And he's got a thing for Blake. Very early on, he's got a thing for Blake. He shows up at the tail end of season one, but really doesn't like make a, a statement until like seasons four and five. But he's kind of a nice, like fun, loving guy most of the time, and he's joined by uh, Neptune Vasilius, who's voiced by Carrie Shawcross. Neptune is not as prevalent as Sun is, but his whole thing is he is able to conjure and control water, but. He hates water, so Neptune is like, eh, I hate water, but I can use it, you know? So he's got these, like, crazy-ass weapon that can do multiple things at once. It's really cool and really fun, and um, though Sun gets more of the screen time, Neptune actually gets involved as he's got a thing for Weiss. There's this uh, big, like, dance party that they're trying to set up in Season 2, and Neptune actually... Um, I guess Weiss actually is the one fawning over Neptune, but Neptune kind of is unsure about it, which is weird because Weiss is like the most popular girl in school other than Pyrrha, so why the fuck would he say no? And they actually go into that a little bit. John actually talks to him about that. So this dance is like this tender moment where, you know, John and Pyrrha and Neptune and Weiss can get together and do things rounding out the what i would say the hero side of things is the other teachers in the school bartholomew ublek voiced by um joey Heyman. his whole thing is he's got a staff but it also ser serves as a flamethrower and that is an awesome thing to say a staff that is a flamethrower it can also uh, double as a thermos don't know how, because it's also a flamethrower, but it works for him. Apparently, he drinks a shit ton of coffee, and that makes him super fucking fast. And he talks super fucking fast, and it, it's just amazing. Um, he's one of the teachers of the school. You've got another one known as Peter Port, who's voiced by Ryan Haywood and uh, Anthony Sardinha. He doesn't really show off a semblance. He's not shown off a whole bunch, but he's like this, this old school, like I'm a lumberjack kind of guy and I'm a, I'm a man's man. And I've got this gigantic mustache and I can tell you all of my tales of glory and shit. So he uses like an ax and a, and a gun and they act as kind of support to Ospin and Glinda. But now we get into the villain side. I told you about Roman Torchwick, but we have to get into bigger villains now. Uh, the biggest of the first three seasons is known as Cinder Fall. Uh, Jessica Nagiri, her weapons of choice is known as, I believe, Midnight, and it doubles as a crossbow slash dual swords mechanic, and her semblance is heat metal from D&D, &D. so she can heat up metal, but there's something quite not right about her at all. She is very devious, very insane, and just very just committed and obsessed to something. And her story really is where everything hinges on, other than Ruby's, where she is the one causing all the mayhem behind the scenes. You've got Roman Torchwick doing all the stuff, but in reality, it's Cinder who's doing all the damage. But she's always alluding to someone who's 
even higher up than she is, which is scary. Because Cinder acts as the main villain from seasons two and three. And way long after that, let me tell you. She's joined by Emerald Soustre, uh, Kate Newell, or Newville. Uh, she is an interesting situation where she's got some pistols, like a lot of people do, for short range or long range. But she's got, like, um, these little comma, like, Asian kind of weapons that can um, deflect damage or do damage in close combat. But her main whole thing is uh, hallucinations. She's a thief. And she uses hallucinations to fuck with people's heads. She's actually more... Uh, vital in seasons three where she causes a lot of mayhem in the vital festival at cinder's beck and call she has this thing where she's uh she wants to be cinder's friend but cinder doesn't really care all that much and it's a bit of a like a like a kind of off-putting vibe that they all give each other because they are not nice people and then to round out the 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 threesome is mercury black he was uh, J.J. Castillo in the first season, or uh, second season, but in the third season onward, they got Yuri Lowenthal, of all people, to give him a voice, and holy fucking crap does Yuri Lo Lowenthal own this character. And I've talked at length about Yuri before, and will many, many, many times, because he's in everything, and he's always good at it. As, as Mercury, he is just this smarmy, just assassin he is just he's just a contemptible son of a bitch like emerald and cinder can kind of get away with like being public faces and like whatever he doesn't want to bother he is just i am the snob i am the asshat and whenever you see him you know shit's gonna go south because his semblance while undefined is tied into his um attack strategy he actually has a set of prosthetic limbs, and it's not alluded to until very late in Ruby's history, but he um, is able to do, like, these crazy-ass kicks and taekwondo and capoeira, like, martial arts, and those prosthetic limbs come in handy. They are defensive, and they are also offensive weapons. He is not somebody to be trifled with and is kind of the muscle whenever Cinder can be asked to actually try. Um, but... Suffice it to say, Cinder is the most dangerous of the three. Emerald can hold her own, but she's mostly support and doing the hallucination shit. And then um, Mercury is there as the, oh, I'll, I'll kill this guy. Let me do it. And so they're always kind of fucking around with Team Ruby. You're fucking around inside Vale and Beacon. And they're the villains of this piece. And they do a good job of finding ways inside and outside of Vale to just fuck with people, but also, like, not let on that they're the evil ones. Like, they're always in masks, or they're always away from, like, the fighting, or they'll join the fight when it gets too serious to not blow their trail. So they are the ones responsible for all the trouble along with Torchwick. But I want to end this season's cast list with uh, probably the most popular character outside of Ruby, in, you know, the top eight, Neo, uh, Neapolitan, and <laughs> I don't even, I don't even know where to start, uh, Neo is probably my favorite character other than, like, Ruby, but mostly because whenever she's on screen, you know, something not right is happening, but in a good way, Neo is voiced by nobody! And that's part of her charm. Apparently, she was meant to have a voice actress, and even in a video game, she did. Like, Casey Lee Williams actually voiced her when they needed voice clips, I guess. But as far as the show goes, as far as Ruby Chibi goes, she has no voice. She doesn't talk. At most, she's all she's ever done was leave a text message. So she doesn't let on anything about herself. You don't get to know anything about her, and it's better that way. Even in Ruby Chibi, the only way she speaks is through like throwing up a fucking sign, like a wood plank sign to tell people you're dumb or you're fetching or your plan is dumb and she winks at the camera and it's like every time she's on screen, she's smiling at the camera like a Deadpool kind of thing where she knows that she's the coolest girl in the room and can't be touched and that is her thing. 
no matter who fights her, no matter what happens to her, for whatever reason, she's able to evade any and all damage. I swear, I, I've watched this entire show, and I've seen her get hit maybe twice? Three times, maybe? Every other time, it's been shenanigans that stopped her from basically kicking the shit out of the dude. She's not the most popular, uh, uh, strongest character at all. It's just that she's so agile. She's a, she avoids damage. She just uses like an umbrella. I don't know if it has like gun stuff like Roberta from Black Lagoon or whatever, but she uses an umbrella as a fucking defensive, like rapier or, or uh, uh, fencing kind of weapon. And it's, it's amazing. It's great. But her semblance is even better because she's basically mystique. She is mystique and she shapeshifts to whatever she wants to be. You need somebody to uh, be a police officer? She can do that. You need her to infiltrate a security firm? She can do that. You want to infiltrate the school? She can do that. She can be whatever you want her to be. And the only way you'll ever know is that one of her eyes is pink. So she's she's got the hair that looks like the ice cream. I don't know if that's how they named her, but but it's got like pink streaks and brown streaks and one of her eyes is pink. And that's the only way you'd ever tell. The only way you'd ever know that you're looking at somebody and she's able to just blend in wherever she needs to. But because she doesn't speak, because she's Roman Torchwick's lover, I suppose, she's there as his muscle too. So she kind of works with Cinder's group Sort of, but whenever she's on screen, it's great. It's just a lovely thing. And I think it's respondent because everybody, like every YouTube comment for the chibi episodes or every like, like if you're going to kill people off, just don't kill Neo. That's it's like every, 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 like it's very rare when characters get killed off or perish or whatever in this show. But when that happens, it's a big deal. And I guarantee you, like, there will be hell to pay if, like, Neo is the one who gets fucked over. You think it's going to happen, and then it doesn't. Because Neo, like, is such an interesting, unique character to have lasted as long as she has. And to have been as popular as she is. And I might be overstating it, but I don't think so. Like, when you see her on screen, you know you're in for a hell of a fight scene. Or you're in for, like, a cool, like, villainous, like, what is she gonna do? What is she gonna do to fuck with people? And, oh my god, and I think it was season, uh, season 7. She pulls off one of the best fucking um, gotcha moments I've ever fucking seen. And I think anybody who's seen season seven's ending will know exactly what it is, but I'm not going to say nothing until we get to that episode, but suffice it to say, Neo is amazing. But the, the cool thing about season two is you get the fuller character models. You get a much better, like animation style. A lot of stuff is improved. You get to learn more about beacon as a city, as a school. So you still have this high school, set up and it's still lighthearted but then you realize that with cinder and neo and all the others something's happening and something dangerous is happening and you have neo being introduced you have penny being introduced and the second song is time to say goodbye again it's more frenetic is it's not as frenetic as the first song i like the first song better but time to say goodbye is still pretty good because you have this like unseen evil that's happening and the the headmasters don't believe we're strong enough to fight for ourselves but we have to take initiative season two is about ruby and juniper taking initiative against orders on some occasions and doing what they have to do to survive to fight off the grim invasion to fight off you know roman and neo because they're like cinder and the others stay in the background their usefulness is uh seasons three so they wait and bide their time. But it's good to see that things are starting to to build on themselves. The Vital Festival is starting to go. And when you get into the season three, that's when things start to change. And I will say with season three, this is where the, se the series starts to go into a darker, more heavier, serious edge. And a lot of that has to do with Monty Ohm's unfortunate passing. Um, apparently he had a procedure go wrong and, uh, passed away very early in life and Shawcross and Luna had to take up the brunt of his story and redo it. And I don't know 
again, I haven't watched like footage or Q and A's or interviews or what they have changed or what they haven't, but this is kind of that split where people like the, the funny, goofy, you know, Ruby TV stuff. And it's, it's still a comedy. This is where the, all of the stuff they were building for the first couple of seasons starts to make headway. And a lot of the darker implications of what Ozpin is hiding or what Ironwood knows or what Glinda knows doesn't hide itself anymore. We start getting a lot of backstory. A lot of the characters start showing backstories. Ruby starts talking about what her power is, what it means to be a hero. Blake starts to uh, talk about a character she knew and was afraid of. Uh, Yang is trying to uh, find her mother who saved her life. Weiss is fighting a family that she's sort of loves, but also sort of resents. You start seeing everybody start to like build their story arcs that will manifest in seasons, you know, in different paces. Every season is going to have its own thing, but they're going to build when they need to. The, the benefit of the story having been built and foreshadowed for so long is that they don't have to throw everything at you for so long. I think they've had a 10 year plan and it's gone that far. They have said they're going to make a 10th season, even after the ninth one. We haven't even had the ninth season yet, but they've built that much. That's why I tend to believe that even though Ohm is dead, his story is still being played out to this day. And a lot of that manifested in earnest in volume three. Now that split of, do I want it to be funny or do I want it to be a more serious? I'm on the camp that I want it to be serious, but I'm not going to fault you if you like the, the, the jovial, you know, the Nora's and the, um, the early season Yang's and stuff like that, where everybody was played for laughs versus, you know, everybody's kind of playing super serious now especially at the end of the season because characters start to build upon themselves. You start to hear this thing known as the four maidens and it plays itself out during the vital festival. The vital festival again was this fighting tournament between all the four kingdoms and all the four kingdoms are together and they're fighting off each other in this tournament and get crowned, you know, just for glory purposes. But you have Cinder's group fucking with everything. You have Roman technically in prison at this point for unleashing the Grimm at Cinder's request, but he escapes because Neo showed up. Of course he did. And, you know, you have all of those villains and then you have the Grimm showing up. So you have to find ways to counterbalance all this. Um, on the villain side, you have Adam Torres showing up. His uh, voice actor is Garrett Hunter his whole thing is he is a swordsman and he is very dangerous. Um, he's a masked guy who's a just insane swordsman. So much so that in the last episode, he actually sliced off Yang's arm. She went to punch him and then he just said, nope, and her arm is gone. And that's when you knew that stuff was getting very, very bad. When you have a character of that level sort of allying with Cinder, but not really. His whole thing is he's a member of the White Fang. He is a Faunus. He's able to absorb energy and then shoot it back at you or get stronger, much like Yang does. But he is a swordsman through and through. He's able to fight any member of Team Ruby one-on-one -on -one and pretty much handle himself. And he shows up in like the mid-seasons as one of the bigger enemies that they deal with. But they introduce him here as a man who knows who Blake is, and actually, whether they were lovers or whatever at one point, they are Faunus, and they know that um, Force can solve many issues and will. The problem is Blake wanted to do so by herself, and the White Fang was a, was a Faunus group that wasn't really meant for the extreme terrorism that a Adam was doing. So Adam is, a, uh, yeah, Adam Taurus is a, is a, is a terrorist and he just leads the White Fang along with Tortwick and says, I'm going to kill stuff and I'm going to revel in it because this is how I can build my kingdom of sorts. So he is involved on the hero scale. We have really strong characters helping out the party as well. None more important than Crow uh, Branwen 
And Crow, alongside Neo, was probably the most integral, like, new character that was introduced in those first couple of seasons. Crow is with the party for good at this point. And he was voiced by Vic Mignogna until, um, uh, again, whenever I bring up Vic Mignogna, I have to reference that I liked him as a voice actor. I liked him as Ed Elric in Fulminal Alchemist. I liked him as Junpei as in Persona 3. And I liked him in this. And he is involved in every season until 8. Or I think it was even 7. When stories about Mignogna grew up on, uh, blew up on Twitter. And unfortunately he was blacklisted. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say what was the story with that. All I will know is that Vic is the really good in this as well playing this sort of like half drunk, half goofball, but very serious and seriously dangerous hero individual and mercenary huntsman. Uh, Later on in the Atlas volumes, he's replaced by Jason Liebrecht, who was in stuff like Darker Than Black and Shin Chan and other stuff like that. I don't think Jason does as well as Vic did, but that's personal preference. I like him as an actor, but I don't know if that was a fit. But I can understand in the circumstances they had to do what they had to do under the duress. Mignogna was blacklisted. What are you going to do? So uh, that's where I'm going to leave it as far as the voice acting thing. Crow himself has a lot of power in and of himself. He's able to transform into a crow at will and fly. But when he needs to fight, he has a gigantic fucking scythe and a gigantic fucking weapon. It's known as the Harbinger. It's the same idea as the multi-weapons that Neptune or Ruby would use. They change into different weapons that need be, and my god, is he very good at his job. And he is a counterbalance to Ironwood being super stiff and Ozpin being a bit too reckless. Um... Crow actually trained Ruby to be a huntsman, and you can see that manifest. His semblance doesn't get mentioned until later, but suffice it to say, it's not something that manifests physically. It's something that happens emotionally. And in later seasons, it will pay, it'll play out, and they will talk about it more, and I will definitely go into it more. The final character I want to talk about is Winter Schnee. Uh, voiced by Elizabeth Maxwell, who was Sai Nijima in Persona 5. Hooray! Persona 5! Still playing it. Go watch it. Anyway, um, so when I heard Winter Schnee, I was like, oh my god, this is great. She's voiced by the exact person you'd want it to be, because Sai is great. And, you know, Elizabeth's been in other stuff like Yakuza 7, and she's great in that. So, to see her voice a character of this magnitude, Winter Schnee is better than Weiss, if you can believe that. Her whole thing is she is basically Weiss on steroids. She's better at all of her you know, glyphs and summonings, but her attack pattern is Ruby super speed, but with finesse. And when she uses swords, the, the coolest part of the early part of season three is Crow and Winter fighting. And it's a draw. And you see that dichotomy of Crow is a bit of a reckless drunk. Winter is this second-in-command to Ironwood and very prim and proper, and she's a schnee, so she carries herself with this this grace. It's, it's amazing. And again, a lot of this has to do with seasons in the Atlas arc later on, where she really gets a lot of story time. But even in season three, looking back on it, she's not some ice queen lady that doesn't care she she finds out that weiss is there and weiss is bowled over that winter is there and and is like i'm not asking you how you're doing in school i'm asking you if you've become a friend i'm asking you if you've learned how to be a person i'm asking if you've been a member of society if you've grown to be a team player and you can tell that winter despite her stature in the atlas military has a softer side when it comes to weiss and it manifests way later despite the fact that she's just a super stiff and the 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 funniest thing in like ruby chibi was an episode with crow and winter having these like little arguments back and forth and it ended up being ospin called him in their office and said 
flirting was way easier back in my day. And I don't think the I don't think the show goes into it. It was just a one off thing, but it was just like them flirting with each other in the guise of combat and just, you know, the opposites attracting. It's just so good. But they act as secondary main characters to the top eight and along with Ozpin as linchpins of the attacks that are going on. And this is where the big plots of Cinder and Roman and Neo and all the manifest. They they are able to like hack into the system. They don't know how or why. Again, we'll get to it when we get to it, but suffice it to say, they're able to hack into Beacon and do all this crazy shit and call the Grim and call the White Fang and just, just becomes a big fucking mess for the finale of the, you know, like three or four episodes of just nothing but a bunch of fights and they're great fight scenes and everybody's using their semblances and everybody's fighting a bunch of Grim and a bunch of like mechs and shit. Um, but when we get to the end, there is this hidden concept crow glinda ironwood and ozpin call pira into a chamber under the building under the school and they talk about the what is known as the four maidens the four maidens are elemental maidens that can harm just harbor this insane power think of the semblances that the superpowers give the characters and, you know, the tiers of that. You have Crow and Winter, kind of the, well, Ospin, technically. Uh, Ospin, James, Ironwood, Crow, and Winter at the top. I'd say Neo fits right in there just because she can't be hurt by anything. But Cinder as well, as far as like that. And then below that, you'd have like Ruby and her team. as Like power level bullshit. This this whole show is power fantasy, the power leveling bullshit, right? But they do it in, in such a like... I fight you and I win or I fight you and you lose. And like, it's good storytelling still, but even beyond that, they have what is known as a maiden and a maiden. Sorry for the click there. A maiden unbeknownst to anything else is stronger than any single person. And imagine what would happen if somebody gained that power. And it turns out that that is Cinder's aim all along, is to become what is known as the Fall Maiden. And she becomes the Fall Maiden, and now her pyromania, while it manifests, is now, like, I can shoot fireballs. I can shoot flame balls of fuck everywhere. And it was meant for Pyrrha. And I bring up Pyrrha again, because she doesn't do a lot in the first and second season other than deal with Jean. But... Ozpin meant for Pira to be the one to inherit the power, and it looked like that was going to happen until Cinder broke broke that free and gained the entire power. And now Cinder is this just crazy-ass fucking powerful person that can be beat on occasion, but it takes multiple people, or it takes the act of God to stop her. Unfortunately... And this is something that, again, much like um, the change from the serious to the um, from the funny to the serious, it doesn't hit home. And even with like Yang's arm being chopped off, that is nothing in comparison to what happens to Pira, because she fights off Cinder despite being not suited for this anymore, because Cinder has the power of the Fall Maiden. Before Ruby's able to save her life and help her. Cinder shoots Pyrrha and she fades away. And I wasn't there. I wasn't a fan of the show when it was happening. But from all accounts, as good of a story as it is to tell Pyrrha's uncertainty and what she means and her destiny to try and become the Fall Maiden but not not do so and then fight back only to succumb in the end, it's not something that people are very fond of. And looking back on it, it's one of those things that I think the creators have understood. They don't do character deaths all that often. And I won't give away who else passes away until that happens. But suffice it to say, they built Pyrrha up to be the core of Team Juniper. The one that John looked up to. And, you know, Nora and Ren were 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 comrades and Pira, the strongest of them all is dead and gone and they don't pull any bullshit. They don't bring her back. 
She's gone. And it took a lot of balls for them not only to cut off Yang's arm and turn her into an invalid, but basically say this character that is one of our top main characters is now gone. This is your life now. This is the serious shit we're going to do. And it's not even just that. It's not even how it's going to affect Jean in the future, and it will. It's not how it even affects Ren and Nora. It affected Ruby. The f- The fall of Beacon ended with Ruby tapping into something she didn't even understand. And that's the only reason that Cinder was fought off, was Ruby had an unknown power that even Cinder couldn't stop, but at the cost of a friend's life. And I don't think fans are too pleased about Pyrrha dying. I'm not. And the fact that Pyrrha is only ever alive in Ruby Chibi, the the spinoff that's non-canon, it's kind of sad. Because her death lingers on the show almost like a Tony Stark kind of thing. Not for the same level of degree, no. But for what she stands as kind of a Captain America symbol to the main character she was the she was the strongest of them she was the one who could fight amongst the evils and now she was taken out so what do you deal with how do you fight this woman who killed the strongest huntress or huntress in training well that's a story for another day but even more than that at the end of the credits at the end of volume three There was this hidden thing they kept saying, they kept referring to her, they kept referring to someone narrating a lot of the world of Remnant pieces. She narrates the end of the show at volume three, and Cinder is even talking to her a lot and says, like, yes, and all this stuff. So she's even a subordinate to somebody. This woman who's powerful enough to kill Pyrrha Nikos is subservient to this person this thing and the last thing you see in volume three is somebody who lingers in the entire show up to this point and remains the worst thing power wise in this entire show even though they don't even tell you why or how the narration starts to stop and this narration is like all encompassing evil the woman that you'd been hearing for three seasons narrating things has finally shown herself in this demonic, witch-like form, Salem. And that lasting image of just this pale, evil-looking woman in black that looks like the Grim is just staring at you, and you realize that Ruby is now out of the fun and games, and Salem is rearing her head and that is what ruby volume three leaves us with into volume four so you have ruby's team decimated you have beacon decimated one of the bastions of the huntress fighting off the grim and then you have these villains that have succeeded in their goal some of them survived some of them did not uh roman tortwick himself passed away he got eaten by one of the grim So how does that affect Neo? How does that affect other people? And Ruby takes a turn for the serious, all with Salem staring at you at the end, realizing that when Volume 4 hits, the party is separated from now on, and things change. And that's where I'll stop for today, because that's not the end of our story. That's just the beginning. And I give Ruby a lot of credit through all of that, from turning into a very serious, very dangerous, and very high-stakes drama from the ashes of this tragedy of this creator who passed away before his time, the remainder of the producers and directors and writers pulled through and decided, we're going to take this in a direction that people aren't expecting, and we're going to do things that probably aren't going to be popular. We're going to get rid of one of our main characters, probably the strongest of the eight main characters other than Ruby, and we're not going to pull any punches. And that's where Ruby stands. And looking back on it, those first three seasons do so much. And it only gets better. 
because next time we're going to do seasons four through five where side stories the parties of ruby and juniper are split and splintered and everybody has their own things to go on but that will do for now next week i will talk about shin megami tensei 5 a game i just finished so i'm i'm finishing a lot of these things like all at once and doing all these fun things all at once and i wanted to get them all in a row shin megami tensei was great but it has problems and i will definitely talk about those next time i get a chance uh ruby seasons four through five will be talked about at length as well and i will start watching those tomorrow for sure and get my way into those and then hopefully i've been putting it off for a little while but mega man x is another thing i've been trying to get into but everything keeps changing and you know it's a fluid system i don't have a a set plan outside of a month in advance but if i'm able to change it up and do something that's more uh current or more pertinent or get a guest i'm willing to change it but as far as we know we've got ruby for two more episodes and then i will do season nine when that finishes and then we'll do shin megami tensei 5 and Mega Man x after that so we've got a full schedule of podcasts coming your way but that'll do it for me today. I've done two podcast recordings and one fell swoop and I really enjoyed it. But as always, I enjoy doing these. I enjoy talking a lot about these shows and games and it really allows me to dig deep into what they're trying to tell me and what they're trying to show me. And I'm hoping that comes across and how I'm able to talk about them. Again, they might not be everybody's cup of tea, and they might be a little too long or a little too short for them. It's fine. But I think this is important for me because I'm able to to review things as I do them, as I feel them. And I would love to hear feedback about specifically this one because I'm trying to watch a show that is ten, that is almost 10 seasons long. It is eight seasons long, eight years at this point, going on nine years. And I'd really like it. And I, you know, did I approach it the right way? Could I have talked about more stuff? I don't know. Am I the best person to talk about Ruby? There are too too many people to, you know, please, I'm sure. But that being said, it is a show that I really respect and admire for what they've done, you know, and not as a fan that grew up on it from season one. I started watching around season six. But I've gone back and I've seen it two times through and I've really respected what they've done. So I hope people have respected this rundown of this show and maybe become a fan themselves. Or if they're already a fan, tell me why they're a fan. And like, did some of my, in, you know, introspection, like, like all my fondness for Neo and like Winter, did that come across? Or did something else like spark them? Or what I love to hear of, from people what they thought of this as I keep going through it because we've still got a lot of Ruby to talk about but as far as volumes one through three that'll do it for me today but thank you guys so much for listening Citizen Strife signing off <laughs>